so so to, to establish Bayesian arguments to apply them, you have to say something about the prior. And mm -hmm. there are an awful lot that could be um, you know, unknown issues uh, mm -hmm. um, in cosmology, physics issues that, that you don't know, and how do you go about establishing uh, uh, you know, a prior or a different prior? I think the issue about priors in this case will be similar to other cases in which people apply Bayesian analysis to physics, which is uh, how is it that you assign priors to a variety of different theories? Um, I think the, you know, they're, they're, uh, plausibly there's a body of knowledge that will be reflected in the assignment of priors. Um, there are worries about whether the Bayesian account will be able to capture things like uh, real cases of theory change. Um, the, there's a question about whether Bayesian updating will capture that, but I think the question about assessing priors will be similar in cosmology as it is in other areas, and so it will reflect a, a lot of plausibility arguments, background knowledge, and so on. And again, the hope is that there will be enough evidence to force convergence on a wide variety. So even if there's a wide degree of uh, disagreement in assignment of priors, that the nature of the evidence will be sufficient to uh, force agreement. Yeah, I was delighted to hear you talk about frequentism versus probability. Um, mm. If I may, though, I mean, it seems to me it, it, we're still brought back to the problem. To me, a, a big sort of issue with, with anthropics is the whole idea of arguments based on, on probable outcomes, really. The first thing is that I agree that there's a, an approach to anthropic reasoning which is more like Bob Dickey's view originally, um, where it was a worry about taking selection effects into account that actually undervalues the evidence. And this is what uh, I take John Barrow to have been saying earlier, that you uh, thought you had a reasoning based on evidence, but you realize that the uh, coincidences you were seeing are actually forced upon you by the selection effect. And so I, I agree with you. I think you were also emphasizing that point. The point I wanted to make with regards to frequentism is partly a definitional claim about the nature of probability that I wanted to, to back away from and that the Bayesians aren't committed to. So I think there's a, a very appealing side of frequentism which says that uh, long range frequencies are certainly going to provide evidence for underlying probabilities. But a frequentist view actually takes that to be a definitional claim rather than an evidential claim. And I was arguing that the Bayesian view that it's rather an evidential relationship rather than a definitional claim is the more appropriate view. And so I think that is more in line with the, uh, the sort of concern about setting up the uh, description of the experiment and the reasoning that you're doing very clearly rather than trying to uh, apply probabilistic reasoning to a sort of impoverished description of the, of the experimental setup. So I think the Bayesianism is compatible with the kind of approach you were arguing for, although perhaps I didn't quite see the, the, the contrast you intended. Yeah, so that the, the, uh, the standard sort of versions of frequentism that I'm thinking about, they're looking at, uh, well, I guess it doesn't have, you could have, if you had independent trials, you could have them repeated simultaneously. So it doesn't actually have to be uh, over time. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I tend to think of myself as a Bayesian as well. Um, mm -hmm. But to try to tease out the differences, I wonder if we could maybe give a, like, a, a worked example. So take a simple case. Um, in another way, some the world fair coin is tossed, and either one observer moment is created, or in the other world, if the coin falls tails, then two <coughs> copies of that same observer moment is mm -hmm. created um, in the same state of mind and everything. Uh, just wonder, like, what probabilities would you uh, would your method uh, prescribe in such a case? Right. Well, there's one general worry I have with these sorts of thoughts experiment, thought experiments, which is that I, I do sometimes worry that they're uh, under-described in a way that makes the indexical information seem more important than it perhaps should be. So um, if you imagine the uh, observer moments as being somehow completely identical, um, then it's, and then you ask from the point of view of sort of a transcendent observer, which of those are you most likely to be in? Um, I'm, I'm concerned about that I mean, setup as a... Suppose that you ask from the point of view of one of these uh, observer moments, mm -hmm. one of these guys. So sorry, so the, the situation again is you have a coin toss, there are two situations created. So it's like the Sleeping Beauty. 
There's one of two. Right, right. One is a world where the coin falls heads, and there is one observer created who lives for one minute or something. Right. Uh, the other possible world is that the coin fall, falls tails, and then uh, there is the two copies of that same um, sequence of observations created. So two observer moments, two observers. Okay, so aside from the worries about the, the, the setup of the thought experiment, I, so in a Sleeping Beauty type case, I think I'll be uh, led to a third or solution by the kind of reasoning that I've uh, advocated here. So, that's so I would say then that the probability of each of those cases is one third. Okay, so I guess then my questions are twofold. So one is um, exactly how does one get this presumably in the tails world where there are two copies. You would want to assign equal probability to you being either of those. So one question is, how do you get that without invoking some thing like the self-sampling assumption? Um, and the second question is, the third solution is equivalent to uh, accepting the self-indication assumption, it seems to me. So then, um, do you have things to say about... Well, I think there's... So again, I think there's um, two different ways of tackling these issues. So one is... Um, are there general principles that we would want to assert quite broadly? And I think your view is that the self-indication assumption isn't something that you should accept as a general principle because of the presumptuous philosopher problem. Is that right? I, I, it, it's, a, it's a legitimate view. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of vaguely tending against accepting it because of that. But mm. I, don't have a, I don't think I have a knockdown argument for that. I think the, the strongest argument against it is the presumptuous philosopher. So if that doesn't right, persuade, right. Then, so, so my tendency in these sorts of cases is to, I mean, maybe, maybe this is uh, not the right way to reason, but in line with what I was saying at the end here, um, in terms of reasoning about selection effects and impoverished evidence, so um, Deeks, for example, gives an analysis of the doomsday argument, which uh, in some sense does something that's very much like invoking the self-indication assumption, but that's invoked in assessing if you had an impoverished body of evidence, if you imagine subtracting somehow knowledge of your own birth rank from your existing body of evidence, what should the effect of that be? And he argues that the effect of that should be to change your priors in the way that, in effect, the self-indication assumption would apply. But that doesn't mean that you're accepting it as a general principle. It's uh, argued for in this specific case. So I'm, I'm a little reluctant to say that there's a general principle like this that I would accept, but perhaps in specific cases, um, reasoning in a way that I think is compatible with Bayesianism would lead me to, to make the same claims as you would based on uh, SIA and SSA. Hi, uh, Alex Kaiserman. Uh, so I, I don't really understand the self-indicating assumption yet, so I just wanted to get clear on it, because uh, I think it would help me. Uh, it's uh, a weighting based on, so the, the prior just reflects the number of uh, members of the reference class, let's say observers, yeah. that the theory predicts exists. And so that will be weighted in such a way that the, the prior will be adjusted corresponding to the number of observers. Now what was your worry about non-normalizability was again, what exactly? Well, so if the claim is that you should have a high probability, all, thing, all other things being equal, you should have a high probability in Hypotheses that have a that imply a greater number of observers, uh, and then I'm just thinking I'm just thinking of the probability function for number of observers, and if that's going to be right. So these aren't these aren't probabilities for numbers of observers. They're the prior probabilities assigned to theories, and so you're adjusting your prior probabilities corresponding to how many. Oh, yeah, so it's the 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 probability for the theory. The either doomsday or live long and prosper, prosper, right? Which is weighted according to how many members. Suppose my theories are just, you know, there are n observers. Um, so I'm sorry. Maybe we can follow yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you.